we're going to get started. Uh, wildlife photography, how to start and how to get better. So uh, just uh, some quick uh, background. Uh, I, I think almost everybody I know, but for anyone I don't, I've been a club member for uh, over 10 years. And um, why am I talking to you about wildlife photography? So there would be two answers to that question. Uh, first is because the steering committee thought this would be a good topic and couldn't find any other volunteer to do it. And the second is uh, I have done not a huge amount and I, it was, it's a secondary interest for me, but uh, I have shot in um, a lot of places in California like the Elephant Seal uh, Rookery and the Sepulveda Basin. And I've shot in Yellowstone in the winter and Costa Rica and a couple of times in Africa. So I have a fair amount of experience in this branch of uh, photography. So that is how I became your speaker for tonight. So things we are going to cover are equipment, how to set up your camera for effective wildlife photography, uh, animal behaviors and why that's important for getting good pictures, wow images, so what to look for that will take your images up to the next level, a little bit about post-processing, and then a discussion about uh, where to shoot locally. So that'll be our topics for this evening and I'm gonna get started. Uh, before I jump into the actual presentation, I do want to uh, offer up a thanks for Carl Volpe, who uh, donated uh, several images to the uh, presentation. And I will uh, try to uh, remember to give him the appropriate credit when we hit his images. And if I forget, uh, he can uh, unmute and shout at me for not doing that. But uh, again, thanks, uh, Carl, for agreeing to uh, donate some images. So equipment. Um, one thing I want to leave you with about this branch of photography is uh, you can never have enough reach. You know, if you have a 400 millimeter lens on your camera, you're going to want a 600. And if you have a 600, you're going to want more than that. You're going to want the ability to, uh, with a, you're going to want to have a large sensor so you'll have the ability to crop images where you just couldn't get close enough to the animal. So you will never have enough reach. And uh, for the close-ups of the animals, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the equipment world is reasonable cost solutions to get that reach. So as um, far as lenses, Sigma and Tamron both make a 150-600 so-called super zoom lens. They, the Tamron Mark II, I think, is about 1300 now. And the Sigma can be had for $900, maybe 1000 They will produce reasonable quality images. And they will go all the way out to 600 millimeters. So that's great. Again, that helps you with this reach issue. They are relatively slow, f6.3, when you, as soon as you begin to zoom out in them. So that's a consideration. I have never found it to be a major factor. The f6.3 seems to work just fine. And uh, as I think everybody on the call knows, the wider apertures will help you uh, blur out your background. If you are the owner or the renter of one of these lenses, you, you have to be nice to them. They're, they're, you're buying a 600 millimeter lens for around $1,000. So one way you can be nice to them, particularly when they're zoomed all the way out, is to shoot at their best spot, which is going to be generally around f.8. Um, if you really feel the need to dissolve your background, you could go to a wider aperture, but you're going to get the sharpest images on these lenses. Again, particularly in the 500 to 600 millimeter range at f.8. So that's a little tip on using a piece of equipment like this. Another option is OEM zoom. So obviously Canon and Nikon and Sony and Olympus uh, all make their own zooms. You know, Canon makes a legendary 100 to 400 millimeter lens, uh, and that is on the Mark II version, or Mark II, I think. And Nikon makes a 200 to 500, uh, and Olympus makes a product like that. Uh, Sony makes a very nice product like that. So OEM zooms are another reasonable choice. Uh, again, you will be jumping up in price, but uh, it's another nice choice and you wouldn't have any compatibility issues. Uh, now, if uh, you can forego buying your next car, you could always get an OEM Prime. Uh, Canon's 600 millimeter fixed F4 
is, I don't know, it's like $13,000 or something. So that is, uh, for the photographer who wants the sharpest possible images, an OEM prime is uh, another choice. It's just very expensive. In addition to these, you're going to want to have a medium zoom for environmental uh, type images. So, you know, your typical 24-105 or 24-120 would be uh, another item to have with you uh, for environmental images. Although one time uh, in my first trip to Africa, an elephant got so close to the Jeep that uh, I had to take off the long lens and put on a 24-105 because it was, uh, I, I couldn't fit it in the frame. It was so close to the uh, Jeep. Anyhow, uh, so those are your suggestions for lenses. Bodies. Most bodies are going to work for wildlife images. However, it's nice to have something with a high frame rate, a large sensor, because again, repeat after me, you can never have enough reach. So the larger sensors give you cropping flexibility. And if you have, a, if it is a large sensor, a crop frame lens uh, doesn't hurt either. So is a, I shoot on Canon equipment, so I'm familiar with that. So this is an example of, uh, again, I, I, in the discussion here, I wanted to try and keep um, recommendations or suggestions at reasonable price points. So a suggestion is the recently released Canon 90D. That is a 32 megapixel crop frame camera has a frame rate of 11 frames per second, and you can buy the body right now for about $1,200. So if you decide wildlife photographer, photography is your thing, and you're starting from scratch, a camera like this or this camera would be a reasonable thing to think about if you don't want to spend too much money. Now, obviously, Sony and Canon and Nikon all have their so-called flagship cameras that would come with uh, larger sensors and higher frame rates, but they're going to cost uh, maybe triple this amount of money. So again, suggestion, that's a nice way to get started if you don't have uh, something that you think is a nice camera for wildlife. Um, other equipment. So I find uh, personally, a monopod is an extremely useful thing to do, to have with wildlife photography and you can get a reasonable one for as little as $50. The lenses that I'm describing are very heavy and it becomes very tiresome to hold them in a shooting position. And what will happen is you'll just get tired and you'll have the lens drop down to your side and then the great image will show up and you won't be ready. With a monopod, you can just stand there all day long and keep, the, keep your lens uh, without any fatigue trained on a potential subject, and it'll be very practical and easy for you to use and, and not fatiguing. So monopod is a good way to go. You know, I've used monopods extensively at the Sepulveda Basin and uh, at the Elephant Seal Rookery. So good choices for, a good choice for supporting your setup. Uh, if you wanna go that route, a tripod is another option. Uh, you might need a gimbal head, which is, uh, I don't know, a 400 or so dollar accessory, but that gives you the ability to quickly move a tripod along any axis and in any direction. And tripod is another option for uh, um, this kind of photography. For your OEM lenses, uh, you can also put multipliers on them. So on the Canon 100-400, you could put a 2.0 multiplier and make it into an 800 millimeter lens. You lose uh, a couple of stops of light when you do that, but that is an option for getting more reach on your lenses. If you're shooting in low light conditions, uh, like I remember I bought one of these for when I went to Costa Rica where we thought we would be trying to shoot birds in the jungle where uh, there wouldn't be much direct light. A uh, better beamer is really an expensive accessory that it sort of wraps around your flash unit and uh, focuses the flash and can be useful for uh, illuminating a subject that might be in a very dark area. So that's something to think about. Uh, if you're in a harsh environment and you're not near your house, uh, a second body is something to consider also. 
Uh, and you know, if you were if you're going to Africa, you, you might really want to bring a, a second body, body as a backup for you. And in I remember in my trip to Costa Rica, we had eight people on the trip, and two of them had camera failure while we were down there because it rained so much. So in harsh environments, your cameras can uh, get degraded, and you might want to consider a second body. So uh, camera setup. These are, I, I'm not going to pretend that these things are the Bible. And if you had uh, 20 wildlife professionals in a room, you might get some different opinions about some of these things. But I think it's fair to say these, these are effective recommendations and would be pretty widespread. So generally speaking, you're going to want your camera in, depending on what your manufacturer calls it, AI servo or continuous autofocus. And you hold down the button that's controlling focusing, keep the focus point trained on the animal, and it will continuously adjust the focus even if as the animal moves left or right, up or down, or more importantly, away from you or closer to you. So most likely you're gonna wanna have your camera in continuous autofocus. Most likely you're gonna to wanna to have a single focus point. So your camera doesn't start to wander and you know, grab onto a tree instead of um, a, a cheetah running, uh, running in front of the tree. So single focus point. Mostly your cameras sometimes have high, high, high speed frame rates and low speed frame rates. Be sure you're in the high speed frame rate. Uh, I got this mixed up once and couldn't understand why my camera is firing so slowly. So if it has both, be sure you've got it into high speed frame rate. Back button focus, um, this might be the most controversial, controversial recommendation or the second most controversial, but if you put 10 wildlife professionals in a room, nine of them at least are going to say, I use back button focus for my animal pictures. And what this does is it, uh, you program a button on the back of your camera and almost all manufacturers support this. And that button is now going to be what focuses the camera. And you have disconnected the focusing from the shutter release. So thinking about combining AI servo or continuous autofocus with back button focus, you can, and a single focus point, you can train the focus point on a moving animal, hold down continuous autofocus and hold down back button focus. And that way keep the animal continuously in focus without releasing the uh, shutter. And when you're ready to release the shutter, then you press that down and your camera begins to fire. So it's a much more practical way to be sure that you obtain good focus on whatever it is you're trying to photograph. So back button focus is a recommendation. Um, so the next thing I want to leave you with is, in addition to you can never have enough reach, you want sharp pictures. So even though you're all muted, uh, repeat after me, I want sharp pictures. And you want to set your camera up so you get sharp pictures even if you sacrifice other things. So uh, I didn't invent this recommendation. I got it from uh, Roy Allen, but I used it very effectively. And what Roy suggested was put your camera in manual mode, not in, uh, T, not in shutter priority or aperture priority, but in manual mode. Uh, set it to whatever f-stop you think is appropriate and Again, that would depend on your lens and what you're trying to accomplish, but probably 5.6 to 8.0 for the um, aperture. And set it to at least 1 1,000, again, assuming you're shooting moving animals, at least 1 1,000th on the shutter speed. So you have fixed both your aperture and your shutter speed, and the shutter speed is going to be high enough. So in most situations, you would capture a sharp image of a moving animal. You could go even higher to one fifteen hundredth or one two thousandths, but at a minimum, I would suggest one one thousandths. So you're fixed on those things. So everybody on the call knows about the exposure triangle and how the camera will compute for you um, the appropriate exposure 
changing either the aperture, the shutter speed, or the ISO. So if you fixed um, the shutter speed and the aperture, something has to vary. And when you set your camera in auto ISO, then at that point, what's varying is your ISO. So um, as a result of setting up your camera this way, you could fire at a relatively high ISO. And my answer is, is as long as you get a sharp image, you really don't care. You know, you can take care of ISO and noise in your images as best you can in post-production and with um, both more modern cameras that are very good about controlling noise and then improvements in software to get noise out of your pictures. You're, you're going to make the take the position is if I got a sharp image, I can take care of noise in my images. So that's the logic behind this recommendation for setting up your camera. Um, now, when I told you that uh, if you put 10 wildlife professionals in a room and uh, nine of them, I can guarantee you would say, I use back button focus. This last recommendation might be a little bit more controversial, but I can tell you that's what I do if I'm shooting moving animals and it's worked quite well for me. Um, so I think at this point, I would take questions if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask any questions. And if there's no questions, then I will move on. We'll give it uh, a few seconds here. Okay, super. Uh, so we did camera setup. Oh, sorry. And uh, I forgot I had one more bullet here. So newer cameras have, um, uh, some of them or many of them have eye tracking. So if your camera supports it, and in the unlikely event, you can actually figure out how to use it you could try eye tracking. Uh, my Canon EOS R has eye tracking and uh, you know, I use it once down at the Sepulveda Basin and just struggle with it and haven't bothered with it since. But that is an option that you can uh, work with. And I do believe some people have been quite successful with it. So explore that uh, option in your uh, menus. Okay, so animal behavior. If you have time, it's very important to carefully observe animal behavior to get your best shots. Where do you want to be? When do you want to be ready? And interesting behaviors. These are all things you're going to want to be considering to get the best possible shots. And you're only going to be able to figure out these things if um, you've had time to observe uh, animal behavior. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples in a second on um, how that helped certain pictures. Uh, and also, if you have a guide or a friend, uh, trust their advice on uh, what to look for in animal behaviors. So uh, this image, uh, courtesy of Carl Volpe of the landing um, uh, pelican, I think at the Sepulveda Basin. Um, so birds are just like airplanes. They always land into the wind. So if you want those shots where the animal is flying uh, almost toward you or directly toward you, you need to figure out what direction the wind is blowing and you put the wind at your back. And you know, if Carl had been way over to the left, he would have gotten a side shot instead of this very lovely funnel shot of the uh, uh, pelican at the Sepulveda Basin. Um, this is uh, at uh, Bosque del Apache. And again, uh, we were kind of lucky here. We didn't really have to reposition, but the wind was blowing at our backs. So, so therefore towards the birds. And as they landed, they were landing into the wind. And you can see this guy spread his wings very nicely and uh, got a reasonable image out of this by again, being in the right spot, which we determined what the right spot was because we looked at their behavior. Um, so I don't think Orly is on the call, but uh, we owe this uh, uh, image to her uh, because this is at the Sepulveda Basin. And she and I were talking and she said, by the way, there's a Camorant out there that is uh, swallowing some fish. So, you know, I said, well, Orly, you're right. There is the, I just saw him do something. Uh, so another one came along. And so at this point, I was ready. You know, I thought there was a pretty good chance that uh, the second one might uh, also be fishing. And I was on a monopod with my uh, lens, and I had it trained exactly and focused 
right on the uh, on the bird, and uh, I, within 30 seconds, I found a fish, and I, I think I ripped off a burst of about six shots, and this was my favorite. But if I hadn't been ready and known to look for this, I probably wouldn't have gotten this image. So again, observe animals' behaviors. Uh, the elephant seal rookery in Cambria, you know, I, I studied uh, seals, the steels up there for a while when I was shooting this, and um, I figured, uh, I saw these two interacting with each other and set up the camera aimed at them and got uh, uh, this, this image. Um, so uh, be cognizant of animal behavior and uh, look for it. So wow images, what to look for. These are behaviors or activities that will, if you can capture them, will take your, photog your animal photography up to the next level. So things to look for, uh, animals eating other animals is always good. You know, it can be harsh, but that's the circle of life and they, they make compelling photographs. Animals fighting each other, either within species or out of species. Animals that are loving each other is a uh, a good behavior to look for. Animals with their babies, uh, animals in motion, and animal eyes. So these are image. These are things to look for in your images that can improve them greatly. And I'm going to show you some examples now. Oh, and environmental. Sorry, environmental images also. So this is animals eating other animals. Uh, this is three coyotes in Yellowstone National Park eating. Uh, uh, probably an elk uh, in the in the middle of winter. So animals eating other animals, uh, animals fighting each other. This is two zebras in uh, Namibia. Um, so they're not really loving each other. It just actually just happened to they were near each other and they happened to, the noses happened to be superimposed on top of each other. But it looks like they're loving each other. So animals loving each other. Um, babies. Uh, this is courtesy of Carl. Uh, so some lion uh, cubs. Actually, they look pretty far along in the drone, but they're still babies. Uh, this is a mom with uh, three cheetahs. Cubs. Uh, courtesy of Carl Volpe, again, uh, very dramatic images of two cheetahs uh, running. Uh, this is a nice close-up of uh, the uh, monkey's eyes. And uh, environmental photos, I'm not sure if this exactly qualifies as an environmental photo, but this is Bosque. So we're not looking at an individual or two individual animal close-ups. This is trying to give the um, viewer of the photograph a feel for the incredible numbers of uh, snow geese that you will see there in, in the December and January migration seasons. So uh, again, Things to look for, fighting, loving, eating, uh, those are all uh, behaviors to look for that will, that will take your images from just being sort of static portraits to something a little more special. So uh, this is post-processing is not really um, within our uh, scope, but um, I did thought, think I would share a few tips with you about this. So. First and foremost, with animal photography, you're gonna generally wanna avoid global adjustments while you're in Lightroom or Photoshop. So, you know, don't go in, you, know, you can do basic things like setting the levels on the image, but don't go in there and grab clarity or texture and adjust the entire image. You wanna do this using the masking tools. Um, so you, do want to add uh, typically texture, clarity, and structure to the animal, but not to the entire picture. And there might be a situation where if you can mask it off, you might want to actually subtract uh, texture and clarity from the non-animal parts of the image. Um, eyes are very, very important. And uh, you are going to want to zoom in, get, you know, go in, you know, um, uh, two times or four times and get right in there on the eyes and brighten, saturate, sharpen only the eyes. So hard to overestimate the importance of eyes in an effective uh, animal picture. So, you know, going back to that picture of the three coyotes, 
I was probably 50 yards shooting across the Madison River. So I was at least 50 yards away from maybe, maybe even more. So the eyes weren't that big, but I still zoomed in as close as I could get and um, put a little more punch in all six eyes of the three coyotes. So eyes are very important and you can uh, adjust this or uh, address this while you're in post-production. Um, Generally, you're going to want to vignette your background and darken it a little bit so the emphasis of the picture is on the animal. And you may want to even vignette part of the animal. So if it's uh, just a face shot, so the face is really what's standing out. Uh, definitely clean up your background. I mean, everybody here has sat through endless image critiques from our various judges. And uh, they all generally emphasize you've got to look uh, Look at your backgrounds and uh, if in the field, if you can reimpose and recompose and shoot from a different direction, great. If not in post, um, see, I didn't make this up, but uh, I think Nancy Learer told me that one of her workshop instructors said this, you as the maker are responsible for every square millimeter of the image. So you need to go in there and if there's a bright twig or a flower or a hot spot from light, Go in there with um, content or fill or the clone stamp tool and get rid of it. You don't want things pulling the viewer's uh, eyes away from the animal. So clean up your background. And uh, last but not least, uh, consider black and white. It can be a little non-obvious with animals, but sometimes that can be very effective. So post-processing, some quick suggestions. Um, uh, no global adjustments, uh, punch up the animal, in particular, punch up the animal's eyes, and be very alert about your background. Darken it, clean it up, and do whatever you need to do to keep the viewer's eyes on the animal. So, um, let's see, before I do where to shoot locally, uh, any more questions about uh, technique or approaches? I'm gonna step up for a second and brighten up my room. I see it got kind of dark in here. So any questions for me at this point? I have a question, Pete. Please, yes, Steve. I'm just curious about cleaning up the background and vignetting and things like that. How do you approach that if you're in a reality-based uh, nature photo situation? Well, uh, so there's, uh, as you know, uh, there are sharp limitations on what you can do here. So, I, you know, I'm just trying to, you can think this through with me, but the, uh, um, the reality based, uh, I, I believe, you know, dodging and burning is allowed. So uh, I think that means you're good to go on vignetting as long as it looks so realistic. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you're not allowed to remove things. So, yeah. um, you know, if, if you are shooting and thinking that it might be entered in uh, um, S4C or a PSA um, uh, exhibition event, then you know, just be careful when you're out in the field or just hope that it doesn't, uh, you know, if you've got that annoying bright twig in your image, uh, just hope that it doesn't degrade the uh, photo too much. Um, so, you know, on some of the ones I showed, um, uh, you know, the fighting zebras was a clean image. Uh, the coyotes was a clean image. And uh, I'll think about other images where, uh, you know, they would not have been uh, eligible for, um, uh, a reality like the nature of classifications for S4C, but I, you know you got to pay attention to the rules. So um, if you're going to enter an, if you're going to enter an image in a in a reality based division, uh, you cannot have you cannot have moved that remove that dreaded twig from the front of the uh, cheetah's uh, uh, nose. So um, that's my answer to that question. Hey Pete, this is Carl. Yeah. From the perspective of S4C or PSA. Uh -huh. uh, your the point is still a strong one in that if you start editing too much, and one of the things I've gotten caught with over the years is I use the radial tool to try to you know sort of focus your eye on the on a, an aspect of the animal, and what happens is your image begins to look like a a portrait. And, and an artificial portrait. So well, I would encourage people to do as little as possible. No, I clean up flowers and things like that, of course. 
but be careful of how you edit your image because as soon as you, if you edit it too much, it begins to look artificial and that does not work in, in wildlife at all. Yeah, no, I agree. I, you know, uh, the, uh, the only quote I can recite that's attributable to uh, Orson Welles is, um, uh, I want to get this right. Uh, uh, let's see, the, the, absence of limit of, the absence of limitation is the enemy of art. So yeah, you have to be very cautious with uh, these adjustments or you just wind up with a weird looking picture. Yeah, and you know, that's not really the intent of uh, animal photography. Right. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, uh, I'm gonna move on then. So where to shoot locally and then I'll show some examples of, um, of pictures at some of these places. So this is, an intent, is not intended to be uh, an exclusive list. So the next time we break for um, questions, if anybody else has um, uh, suggestions on where to shoot locally, uh, please uh, share those. So the Magoo Lagoon is um, not far from where we live and nice for uh, bird photography. Um, if it ever happens again, uh, Butterflies Alive exhibition in the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum is really a fun spot. They, um, they run that uh, during the summer, typically, up at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. Uh, Sepulveda Basin, the club has, of course, run a number of field trips down there, and that is a great spot for uh, birds. The Elephant Seal Rookery, a little further um, from home, but uh, that's up in Cambria. You can reach that in, I don't know, you know two and two and three quarter hours of hard driving. And in the, the, season, the, the season where the babies show up in December and January, especially that place is really a lot of fun. Uh, Bolsa Chica down in Orange County is a fun spot. Any of our zoos, if they ever reopen again, are obvious uh, places to go shoot animals. The Ojai Raptor Show has generally been done in the spring there and you can get very close to interesting looking birds that uh, make for, you know, they're not in a real habitat, but they make for nice portraits. And, uh, you know, anywhere, uh, open spaces, islands, beaches, uh, your backyard. I, I've been uh, chasing an elusive squirrel in my backyard. When my wife and I have dinner out on our back patio, uh, there's a squirrel who shows up often and uh, some nights I'll just sit there with a long lens all set up and the hopes of uh, winning squirrel of the month in the uh, acorn. Um, so there's lots of choices for these things, but here are some, at least some suggestions for local spots where you can see uh, and photograph animals. So some examples, um, uh, let's see, I'm killing two birds with one stone. This is from Butterflies Alive, and uh, it's obviously a uh, black and white that somehow it just seemed to work better for me than the color photo uh, of uh, the butterfly. So butterfly is a live example and an example of black and white processing for animals. Uh, this is at the uh, elephant seal workery last uh, January uh, with the uh, babies in full force up there. So there, there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, elephant seals, both uh, parents and babies and lots of uh, nice images. Um, this is at the uh, LA Zoo. And I'll point out a couple things on this image uh, to um, Steve Friedman's comment. I think this was, I, I think I cleaned up some stuff in here that was uh, too annoying. So in the back here, so this wouldn't have been eligible for uh, the nature categories. At least I think that's true on this image. Also, uh, you can look at the eyes of the animal and I definitely zoomed in and increased the saturation and the brightness of the uh, the animal's eyes. Uh, hopefully I didn't get carried away and nobody finds it annoying, but if you do, too bad. But uh, anyway, uh, this is a good example of the LA Zoo. Uh, this tiger done in black and white, also uh, the LA Zoo. And by the way, both of these were shot on that, uh, whatever they call it, the LA Zoo photo day last November. So, you know, that, that thing is a little pricey, but you will have good access to the animals and their feeding them, you know, going back to the, the, the one before, uh, they had just thrown in uh, some peppers and I was able to get the shot of, of him eating the uh, red pepper. 
So that can be a, a fun uh, event to go to and get some good animal pictures. Um, this is at the Ojai Raptor Show. Uh, this is from the club's field trip, Anacap Isle, another a good spot in uh, the springtime for uh, animal photography. Uh, this is at another club field trip about 10 years ago at Joshua Tree National Park. Uh, we got a nice look at a chuckwalla. Uh, 